Chapter One of Farewell to Nicola by Guy Boothby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter One We were in Venice, Venice the silent and mysterious, the one European city of which I never tire. My wife had not enjoyed good health for some months past, and for this reason we had been wintering in southern Italy. After that we had come slowly north, spending a month in Florence, a fortnight in Rome, en route, until we found ourselves in Venice, occupying a suite of apartments at Galaghetti's famous hotel overlooking the Grand Canal. Our party was a small one. It consisted of my wife, her friend Gertrude Trevor, and myself, Richard Hatteras, once of the South Sea Islands, but now of the New Forest, Hampshire, England. It may account for our fondness of Venice when I say that four years previous we had spent the greater part of our honeymoon there. Whatever the cause may have been, however, there could be no sort of doubt that the grand old city, with its palaces and churches, its associations stretching back to long-forgotten centuries, and its silent waterways possessed a great fascination for us. We were never tired of exploring it, finding something to interest us even in the most out-of-the-way corners. In Miss Trevor we possessed a charming companion, a vital necessity, as you will admit, when people travel together. She was an uncommon girl, in more ways than one. A girl, so it seems to me, England alone is able to produce. She could not be described as a pretty girl. But then the word pretty is one that sometimes comes perilously near carrying contempt with it. One does not speak of Venus de Medici as pretty nor would one describe the Apollo of Belvedere as very nice-looking. That Miss Trevor was exceedingly handsome would, I fancy, be generally admitted. At any rate, she would command attention wherever she might go, and that is an advantage which few of us possess. Should a more detailed description of her be necessary, I might add that she was tall and dark, with black hair and large luminous eyes that haunted one and were suggestive of a southern ancestor. She was the daughter, and indeed the only child, of the well-known Dean of Bedminster, and this was the first time she had visited Italy, or that she had been abroad. The wonders of the art country were all new to her, and in consequence our wanderings were one long succession of delight. Every day added some new pleasure to her experiences, while each night saw a life desire gratified. In my humble opinion, to understand Italy properly, one should not presume to visit her until after the first blush of youth has departed, and then, only when one has prepared oneself to properly appreciate her many beauties, Venice, above all others, is a city that must be taken seriously. To come at a proper spirit of the place, one must be in a reverent mood. Cheap jokes and cockney laughter, as unsuited to the place, where Faleri yielded his life, as a downcast face would be in Nice at carnival time. On the afternoon of the particular day from which I date my story, we had been to the island of Murano to pay a visit to the famous glass factory, of which it is the home. By the time we reached Venice once more, it was nearly sunset. Having something like an hour to spare, we made our way, at my wife's suggestion, to the Florian Caff on the Piazza St. Mark in order to watch the people. As usual, the place was crowded. And at first glance, it looked as if we would be unable to find sufficient vacant chairs. Fortune favoured us, however. And when we had seated ourselves, and I had ordered coffee, we gave ourselves up to the enjoyment of what is perhaps one of the most amusing scenes in Venice. To a thoughtful mind, the great square must at all times be an object of absorbing interest. I have seen it at every hour and at almost every aspect, at a break of day, which one has to oneself and is able to enjoy its beauty undisturbed, at midday when the importunate shopkeepers endeavour to seduce one into entering their doors, by tales of the marvels therein, at sunset when the cafes are crowded, the band plays, and all is merriment, and last but not least at midnight when the moon is sailing above St Mark's, the square is full of strange shadows, and the only sound to be heard is the cry of a gull on the lagoon, or the sapremi of some belated gondolier. 
this is the moment to which i have looked forward all my life said miss trevor as she sat back in her chair and watched the animated crowd before her look at that pretty little boy with the pigeons flocking round him what a picture he would make if only one had a camera if you care to have a photo of him one can easily be obtained i remarked any one of these enterprising photographers would only be too pleased to take one for you for a few centisimi i regret to say that many of our countrymen have a weakness for being taken in that way fancy septimus brown of tooting my wife remarked a typical english paterfamilias with a green veil blue spectacles and white umbrella daring to ask the sun to record his image with the pigeons of st mark's clustering about his venerable head can't you picture the pride of that worthy gentleman's family when they produce the album on sunday afternoons and show it to their friends this is pa the eldest girl will probably remark when he was travelling in venice as if venice were a country in which one must be perpetually moving on and that's how the pigeons came down to him to be fed isn't it splendid of him papa who never ventured beyond brighton beach before would be a person of importance for that moment you forget one circumstance however miss trevor replied who enjoyed an argument and for this reason contradicted my wife on principle and in allowing himself to be taken at all brown of tooting has advanced a step for the moment he dared to throw off his insularity as the picture at which you are laughing is indisputable testimony do you think he would dare to be photographed in a similar fashion in his own marketplace standing outside his shop door with his assistants watching him from behind the counter i'm quite sure he would not a very excellent argument i answered unfortunately however it carries with it its own refutation the mere fact that brown takes the photograph home to show his friends goes a long way to proving that he is still as insular as when he set out if he did not consider himself of sufficient importance to shut out a portion of st mark's with his voluminous personality he would have not employed the photographer at all in which case we're no further advanced than before these little sparring matches were a source of great amusement to us the cockney tourist was miss trevor's bete noire upon this failing my wife and i loved to twit her on the whole i rather fancy she liked being teased by us we had finished our coffee and were still idly watching the people about us when i noticed that my wife had turned a little pale i was about to remark upon it when she uttered an exclamation as if something had startled her good gracious dick she cried surely it's not possible it must be a mistake what is it that cannot be possible i inquired what do you think you see I glanced in the direction she indicated, but could recognise no one with whom I was acquainted. An English clergyman and his daughter were sitting near the entrance to the cafe, and some officers in uniform were on the other side of them again. But still my wife was looking in the same direction, and with an equally startled face. I placed my hand upon her arm. It was a long time since I had seen her so agitated. Come, darling, I said, tell me what it is that troubles you look she answered can you see the table a little to the right of that which those officers are seated i was about to reply in the affirmative but the shock i received deprived me of speech the person to whom my wife referred had risen from his chair and was in the act of walking towards us i saw him i looked at him looked away and then looked again no there was no room for doubt the likeness was unmistakable i should have known him anywhere he was dr nikola the man who had played such an important part in our life's drama five years had elapsed since i had last seen him but in that time he was scarcely changed at all he was the same tall thin figure the same sallow clean-shaven face the same piercing black eyes as he drew nearer i noticed that his hair was a little more grey that he looked slightly older otherwise he was unchanged but why was he coming to us surely he did not mean to speak to us after the manner in which he had treated us in bygone days i scarcely knew how to receive him he on his side however was quite self-possessed raising his hat with that easy grace that always distinguished him he advanced and held out his hand to my wife my dear lady hatteras he began in his most conciliatory tone i felt sure you would recognise me observing that you had not forgotten me i took the liberty of coming to pay my respects to you 
then before my wife could reply he had turned to me and was holding out his hand for a moment i had half determined not to take it when his glittering eyes looked into mine i changed my mind and shook hands with him more cordially than i should ever have thought it possible for me to do having thus broken the ice and as we had to all intents and purposes permitted him to derive the impression that we were prepared to forgive the past nothing remained for us but to introduce him to miss trevor from the moment that he had approached us she had been watching him covertly and that he had produced a decided impression upon her was easily seen for the first time since we had known her she usually so staid and unimpressionable was nervous and ill at ease the introduction effected she drew back a little and pretended to be absorbed in watching a party of our fellow countrymen who had taken their places at a table a short distance away from us for my part i do not mind confessing that i was by no means comfortable i remember my bitter hatred of nikola in the days gone by i recall that terrible house in port said and thought of the night on the island when i had rescued my wife from his clutches in my estimation then he had been a villain of the deepest dye and yet here he was sitting beside me as calm and collected and apparently as interested in the resume of our travels in italy that my wife was giving him as if we had been bosom friends throughout our lives in any one else it would have been a piece of marvellous effrontery in nicola's case however it did not strike one in the same light as i have so often remarked he seemed incapable of acting like any other human being his extraordinary personality lent a glamour to his simplest actions and demanded for them an attention they would scarcely have received had he been less endowed have you been long in venice my wife inquired when she had completed the record of our doings feeling she must say something i seldom remain anywhere for long he answered with one of his curious smiles i come and go like a will of the wisp i'm here to-day and gone to-morrow it may have been an unfortunate remark but i could not help uttering it for instance you are in london to-day i said in port side next week and in the south sea islands a couple of months later he was not in the least disconcerted ah i see you have not forgotten our south sea adventure he replied cheerfully how long ago it seems does it not to me is like a chapter out of another life then turning to miss trevor who of course had heard the story of our dealings with him sufficiently to often be weary of it he added i hope you are not altogether disposed to think ill of me perhaps some day you will be able to persuade lady hatteras to forgive me that is to say if she has not already done so yet i do not know why i should plead for pardon seeing that i am far from being in a repentant mood as a matter of fact i am very much afraid that should the necessity arise i should be compelled to act as i did then then let us pray most fervently that the necessity may never arise i answered i for one do not entertain a very pleasant recollection of that time i spoke so seriously that my wife looked sharply up at me fearing i suppose that i might commit myself she added quickly i trust it may not for i can assure you dr nikola that my inclinations lie much nearer bond street than the south sea island all this time miss trevor said nothing but i could tell from the expression upon her face that nikola interested her more than she would ever been willing to admit is it permissible to ask where you are staying he inquired breaking the silence and speaking as it were a point upon which he was most anxious to be assured at galaghetti's i answered while in venice we always make it our home ah the good galaghetti said nikola softly it's a long time since i last had the pleasure of seeing him i fancy however he would remember me i was able to do him a slight service some time ago and i have always understood that he possesses a retentive memory then doubtless feeling that he had stayed long enough he rose and prepared to take leave of us perhaps lady hatteras you will permit me to do myself the honour of calling upon you he said i should be very pleased to see you my wife replied though with no real cordiality he then bowed to miss trevor and shook hands with myself good-bye hatteras he continued i shall hope soon to see you again i expect we have lots of news for each other and doubtless you will be interested to learn the history and subsequent adventures 
of that peculiar little stick which caused you so much anxiety and myself so much trouble five years ago my address is the palace revici in the rio di consiglio where needless to say i shall be delighted to see you if you care to pay me a visit i thanked him for his invitation and promised that i would call upon him with a bow he took his departure leaving behind him a sensation of something missing something that could not be replaced to sit down and continue the conversation where he had broken into it was out of the question we accordingly rose and after i had discharged the bill strolled across the piazza towards the lagoon observing that miss trevor was still very silent i inquired the cause if you really want me to tell you i can only account for it by saying that your friend dr nicola has occasioned it she answered i don't know why it should be so but that man has made a curious impression upon me he seems to affect every one in a different manner i said and for some reason made no further comment upon her speech when we had called a gondola and were on our way back to the hotel she referred to the subject again i think i ought to tell you that it is not the first time i have seen dr nicola she said you may remember that yesterday while phyllis was lying down i went out to do some shopping i cannot describe exactly which direction i took save that i went towards the rialto it is sufficient that in the end i reached a chemist's shop it was only a small place and very dark so dark indeed that i did not see that it contained another customer until i was really inside and i noticed a tall man busily engaged in conversation with the shopman he was declaiming against some drugs he had purchased there on the previous day and demanding that for the future there should be a better quality otherwise he would be compelled to take his patronage elsewhere in the middle of this harangue he turned round and i was permitted an opportunity of seeing his face he was none other than your friend dr nicola but my dear gertrude said phyllis with all due respect to your narrative do not see that the mere fact of your having met the dr nicola in a chemist's shop yesterday and your having been introduced to him to-day should have caused you so much concern i don't know why it should she answered but it is a fact nevertheless ever since i saw him yesterday his face with its terrible eyes has haunted me i dreamt of it last night all day long i have had it before me and now as if to add to the strangeness of the coincidence he proves to be the man of whom you have so often told me your demoniacal fascinating nicola you must admit that it is very strange a coincidence a mere coincidence that is all i replied nicholas possesses an extraordinary face and it must have impressed itself more deeply upon you than the average countenance is happy enough to do whether my explanation satisfied her or not she said no more upon the subject but that our strange meeting with nicola had an extraordinary effect upon her was plainly observable as a rule she was bright and merry a companion as one could wish to have on this particular evening however she was not herself at all it was the more annoying for the reason that i was anxious that she should shine on this occasion as, as i was expecting an old friend who was going to spend a few days with us in venice that friend was none other than the duke of glenbarth who previous to his succession to the dukedom had been known as the marquis of beckenham and who as the readers of the history of my adventures with dr nicola may remember figured as a very important factor in that strange affair ever since the day when i had had the good fortune to render him a signal service in the bay of a certain south coast watering place and from the time that he accepted my invitation to join us in venice i had looked forward to his coming with the greatest possible eagerness as it happened it was well nigh seven o'clock by the time we reached our hotel without pausing in the hall further than to examine the letter rack we ascended to our rooms on the floor above my wife and miss trevor had gone to their apartments i was about to follow their example as soon as i had obtained something from the sitting-room a nice sort of host a very nice host said a laughing voice as i entered he invites me to stay with him and is not at home to bid me welcome my dear old dick how are you my dear fellow i cried hastening forward to greet him I must beg your pardon ten thousand times. I had not the least idea that you'd be here so early. We've been sitting on the piazza and did not hurry home. You needn't apologise, he answered, for once an Italian train was before its time. Now tell me about yourself. 
how is your wife how are you what sort of holiday are you having i answered his question to the best of my ability keeping back my most important item as a surprise for him and now i said it's time to dress for dinner but before you do so i have some important news for you who do you think is in venice needless to say he mentioned every one but the right person you'd better give up you'll never guess i said who is the most unlikely person you expect to see in venice at the present moment old macpherson my solicitor he replied promptly the rascal would no more think of crossing the channel than he would contemplate standing on his head in the middle of the strand must be macpherson nonsense i cried i don't know macpherson in the first place and i doubt if he would interest me in the second no no this man is neither a scotchman nor a lawyer he is an individual bearing the name of nicola i quite expected to surprise him but i scarcely look for such an outbreak of astonishment what he cried in amazement you must be joking you don't mean to say that you have seen nicola again i not only mean that i have seen him i replied but i'll go further than that and say that he was sitting on the piazza with us not more than half an hour ago what do you think his appearance in venice means i don't know what to think he replied with an expression of almost comic bewilderment upon his face it seems impossible and yet you don't look as if you're joking i tell you the news in all sober earnestness i answered dropping my bantering tone it is a fact that nicola is in venice and what is more that he has given me his address he has invited me to call upon him and if you like we'll go together what do you say i shall have to have time to think about it glenbarth replied seriously i don't suppose for a moment he has any intention of abducting me again nevertheless i am not going to give him the opportunity by joe how that fellow's face comes back to me it haunts me miss trevor has been complaining of the same thing i said miss trevor the duke repeated and pay who may miss trevor be a friend of my wife's i answered she has been travelling with us for the last few months i think you will like her now come along with me and i'll show you your room i suppose your man has discovered it by this time stevens would find it if this hotel were constructed on the same principle as the maze at hampton court he answered he has the virtue of persistence when he wants to find a thing he secures the person who would be the most likely to tell him and sticks to him until his desire has been gratified it turned out as he had predicted and three quarters of an hour later our quartet sat down to dinner my wife and glenbarth by virtue of an old friendship agreed remarkably well while miss trevor now somewhat recovered from her nicola indisposition was more like her old self it was a beautiful night and after dinner it was proposed seconded and carried unanimously that we should charter a gondola and go for a row upon the canal on our homeward voyage the gondolier by some strange chance turned into the rio del consiglio perhaps you can tell me which is the palace for vichy i said to the man he pointed to a building we were in the act of approaching there it is signor he said at one time it was a very great palace but now here he shrugged his shoulders to enable us to understand that its glory had departed from it not another word was said upon the subject but i noticed that all our faces turned in the direction of the building with the exception of one solitary window it was in total darkness as i looked at the latter i wondered whether nicola were in the room and if so what was he doing was he poring over some of his curious books trying some new experiment in chemistry or putting to test some theory such as i had found him at work upon in that curious house in port said a few minutes later we had left the rio di consiglio behind us i turned to the right and were making our way back by another watery thoroughfare towards the grand canal thanks to your proposition we've had a delightful evening miss trevor said as we paused to say good night at the foot of the staircase a quarter of an hour or so later i have enjoyed myself immensely you should not tell him that dear said my wife you know how conceited he is already he will take all the credit and be unbearable for days afterwards and turning to me she added you are going to smoke i suppose i had thought of doing so i replied and then i added with mock humility if you do not wish it of course i will not do so i was only going to keep glenbarth company they laughed and bade us good night and when we had seen them depart in the direction of the rooms 
we lit our cigars and passed into the balcony outside at this hour of the night the grand canal looked very still and beautiful and we both felt the humour for its confidences do you know hatteras said glenbarth after the few moments pause that followed our arrival in the open air that nicola's turning up in venice at this particular juncture savours to me a little of the uncanny what his mission may be of course i cannot tell but that it is some diabolical thing or another i haven't a doubt one thing is quite certain i answered he would hardly be here without an object and after our dealings with him in the past i am prepared to admit that i don't trust him any more than you do and now that he has asked you to call upon him what are you going to do i paused before i replied the question involved greater responsibilities than were at first glance apparent knowing nicola so well i had not the least desire or intention to be drawn into any of the plots or machinations he was so fond of working against other people i must confess nevertheless that i could not help feeling a large amount of curiosity as to the subsequent history of that little stick to obtain which he had spent so much money and had risked so many lives yes i think i shall call upon him i said reflectively as if i had not quite made up my mind surely to see him once more could do no harm good heavens what an extraordinary fellow he is fancy you or i being afraid of any other man as we are afraid of him for mind you i know that you stand quite as much in awe of him as i do why do you know when my eyes fell upon him at this afternoon i felt the return of the old dread of his presence used to cause in me five years ago the effect he had upon miss trevor was also very singular when you come to think of it by the way hatteras talking of miss trevor what an awfully nice girl she is i don't know when i have ever met a nicer who is she she is the daughter of the dean of bedminster i answered splendid old fellow i like his daughter the duke remarked yes i may say that i like her very much i was glad to hear this for i had my own little dreams and my wife who by the way is a born matchmaker had a long time ago come to a similar conclusion she is a very nice girl I replied and what is more she is as good as she is nice then i continued he will indeed be a lucky man who wins gertrude trevor for his wife and now since our cigars are finished what do you say to bed it's growing late i expect you're tired after your journey i'm quite ready he answered i shall sleep like a top i only hope and pray that i shall not dream of nicola end of chapter one chapter two of farewell to nicola by guy boothby this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two whether it was our excursion upon the canal that was responsible for it i cannot say the fact however remains that the next morning every member of our party was late for breakfast my wife and i were the first to put in an appearance glenbarth followed shortly after and miss trevor was last of all it struck me that the girl looked a little pale as she approached the window to bid me good morning and as she prided herself upon her punctuality i jestingly reproved her for the late rising i'm afraid your gondola excursion proved too much for you i said in a bantering tone or perhaps you dreamt of dr nicola i expected her to declare in her usual vehement fashion that she would not waste her time dreaming of any man but to my combined astonishment and horror her eyes filled with tears until she was compelled to turn her head away in order to hide them from me it was all so unexpected that i did not know what to think as may be supposed I had not the slightest intention of giving her pain nor could i quite see how i managed to do so it was plain however that my thoughtless speech had been the means of upsetting her and i was heartily sorry for my indiscretion fortunately my wife had not overheard what had passed between us is he teasing you again gertrude she said as she slipped her arm through her friends take my advice and have nothing to do with him treat him with contempt besides the coffee is getting cold and that is a very much more important matter let us sit down to breakfast nothing could have been more opportune we took our places at the table and by the time the servant had handed the first dishes miss trevor had recovered herself sufficiently to be able to look me in the face 
and to join in the conversation without the likelihood of a catastrophe still there can be no doubt she was far from being in a happy frame of mind i said as much to my wife afterwards when we were alone together she told me she had a very bad night the little woman replied our meeting with dr nikola yesterday on the piazza it upset her for some reason or another she said that she dreamt of nothing else as you know she is very highly strung and when you think of the descriptions we have given her of him it is scarcely to be wondered that she should attach an exaggerated importance to our unexpected meeting with him that is the real explanation of the mystery one thing however is quite certain in her present state of mind she must see no more of him than could be helped it might upset her altogether oh why did he come here to spoil our holiday i cannot see that he has spoilt it my dear i returned putting my arm round her waist and leading her to the window the girl will very soon recover from her fit of depression and afterwards will be as merry as a marriage bell by the way i don't know why i should think of it just now talking of marriage bells reminds me that glen bath told me last night that he thought gertrude one of the nicest girls he had ever met i am delighted to hear it my wife answered and still more delighted to think that he had such a good sense do you know i have set my heart upon that coming to something no you needn't shake your head for very many reasons it would be a most desirable match for my own part i believe it was for no other reason that you bothered me into inviting him to join our party here you are a matchmaker i challenge you to refute the accusation i shall not attempt to do so she retorted with considerable hauteur it is always a waste of time to argue with you at any rate you must agree with me that gertrude would make an ideal duchess so you have travelled as far as that have you i inquired i must say that you jumped to conclusions very quickly because glen bath happens to have said in confidence to me a confidence i am willing to admit i have shamefully abused that he considers gertrude trevor a very charming girl it does not follow that he has the very slightest intention of asking her to be his wife why should he if he doesn't he is not fit to sit in the house of lords she answered as if that ought to clench the argument fancy a man posing as one of our hereditary legislators who doesn't know how to see such a golden opportunity as a good churchwoman i pray for the nobility every sunday morning and if not knowing where to look for the best wife in the world may be taken as a weakness and it undoubtedly is then all i can say is that they require all the praying for they can get but i should like to know how is he going to marry the best wife in the world i asked by asking her she retorted he doesn't surely suppose she's going to ask him if he values his life he'd better not do that i said savagely he will have to answer for it to me if he does ah she answered her lips curling i thought as much you are jealous of him you don't want him to ask her because you fancy that if he does your reign will be over nice admission for a married man i must say i presume you mean because i refuse to allow him to flirt with my wife i mean nothing of the kind and you know it how dare you say dick that i flirt with the duke because you have confessed it i answered with a grin of triumph for i had got her a corner at last did you not say only a moment ago that if he did not know where to find the best wife in the world he was unfit to sit in the house of lords did you not say that he ought to be ashamed of himself if he did not ask her to be his wife answer that my lady i admit i did say it but you know very well that i referred to gertrude trevor gertrude trevor is not yet a wife the best wife in the world is beside me now and since you are already proved to be in the wrong you must perforce pay the penalty she was in the act of doing so when gertrude entered the room oh dear she began hesitating in pretended consternation is there never to be an end of it end of what demanded my wife with some little asperity for well, she does not like her little endearments to be witnessed by other people of this billing and cooing the other replied you two insane creatures have been married more than four years and yet a third person can never enter the room without finding you love-making i declare it upsets all of one's theories of marriage one of my most cherished ideas was that this sort of thing ceased with the honeymoon and the couple invariably lead a cat and dog life for the remainder of their existence so they do my wife answered unblushingly and what can you expect when one is a great silly creature who will not learn to jump away and be looking innocently out of the window when he hears the handle turned never marry gertrude mark my words you will repent it if you do 
well for ingratitude and cool impudence that surpasses everything i said in astonishment why you audacious creature not more than five minutes ago you were inviting me to co-operate in the noble task of finding a husband for miss trevor richard how can you stand there and say such things she ejaculated gertrude my dear i insist that you come away at once i don't know what he will say next miss trevor laughed i like to hear you two squabbling she said please go on it amuses me yes i will certainly go on i returned perhaps you heard her declare that she fears what i might say next of course she does allow me to tell you lady hatteras that you are a coward if the truth were known it would be found that you are trembling in your shoes at this moment for two centimes paid down i would turn queen's evidence and reveal the whole plot you had better not sir she replied shaking a warning finger at me in that case the letters from home shall be withheld from you and you will not know how your son and heir is progressing i capitulate i answered threatened by such awful punishment i dare say no more miss gertrude will you not intercede for me i think you scarcely deserve it she retorted even now you are keeping something back from me never mind my dear we'll let him off this time with a caution said my wife provided he promises not to offend again and now let us settle what we are going to do to-day when this important matter had been arranged it was reported to us that the ladies were to spend the morning shopping leaving the duke and myself free to follow our own inclinations accordingly when we had seen them safely on their way to the Merceria, we held a smoking council to arrange how we should pass the hours until lunch-time as we discovered afterwards we both had a certain thought in our minds which for some reason we scarcely liked to broach to each other it was settled however just as we desired but in a fashion we least expected we were seated in the balcony outside our room watching the animated traffic on the grand canal below when a servant came in search of us and handed me a note one glance at the characteristic writing was sufficient to show me that it was from dr nikola i opened it with an eagerness that i did not attempt to conceal and read as follows dear hatteras if you have nothing more important on hand this morning can you spare the time to come and see me as i understand the duke of denbath is with you will you not bring him also it'll be very pleasant to have a chat upon bygone days and what is more i fancy this old house will interest you yours very truly nikola what do you say i inquired when i had finished reading shall we go let us do so by all means the duke replied it will be very interesting to meet nikola once more there is one thing however that puzzles me how did he become aware of my arrival in venice you say he was with you on the piazza last night so that he could not have been at the railway station and as i haven't been outside since i came except for the row after dinner i confess it puzzles me you should know by this time that it is useless to wonder how nikola acquires his knowledge i replied for my own part i should like to discover his reason for being in venice i am very curious on that point glenbarth shook his head solemnly if nikola does not want us to know he argued we shall leave his house as wise as we entered it if he does let us know i shall begin to grow suspicious for in that case it's a thousand pounds to this half-smoked cigar that we should be called upon to render him assistance however if you are prepared to run the risk i will do so also in that case i said rising from my chair and tossing what remained of my cigar into the water below let's get ready and be off we may change our minds ten minutes later we had chartered a gondola and were on our way to the palace of Ravici. as a general rule when one sets out to pay a morning call one is not the victim of any particular nervousness on this occasion however both glenbarth and i as we confessed to each other afterwards were distinctly conscious of being in a condition which would be described by persons of mature years as an unpleasant state of expectancy but by which schoolboys is denominated funk the duke i noticed fidgeted with his cigar allowed it to go out and then sat with it in his mouth unlighted there was a faraway look on his handsome face that told me he was recalling some of the events connected with the time when he had been in nicholas company this proved to be the case for as we turned from the grand canal into the street in which the palace is situated he said by the way hatteras i wonder what became of baxter 
Prendergast, and those other fellows. Nicola may be able to tell us, I answered. Then I added after a short pause, By Jove, what strange times those were. Not half so strange to my thinking as our finding Nicola in Venice, Glenbarth replied. That is the coincidence that astonishes me. See, here we are. As he spoke, the gondola drew up at the steps of the Palace of Vichy, and we prepared to step ashore. As we did so, I noticed that the armorial bearings of the family still decorated the posts on either side of the door. But by the light of day, the palace did not look nearly so imposing as it had done by moonlight the night before. One thing about it was certainly peculiar. When we ordered the gondolier to wait for us, he shook his head. Not for anything would he remain there longer than was necessary to set us down. I accordingly paid him off, and when we had descended the steps, we entered the building. On pushing open the door, we found ourselves standing in a handsome courtyard, in the centre of which was a well, its coping elegantly carved with a design of fruit and flowers. A broad stone staircase at the further end led up to the floor above, but this, as was the case with everything else, showed unmistakable signs of having been allowed to fall into decay. As no concierge was to be seen, and there was no one in sight of whom we might make inquiries, we scarcely knew how to proceed. Indeed, we were just wondering whether we should take our chance and explore the lower regions in search of Nicola, when he appeared at the head of the staircase and greeted us. Good morning, he said. Pray come up. I must apologise for not having been downstairs to receive you. By the time he had finished speaking, he had reached us, and was shaking hands with Glenbarth with the heartiness of an old friend. Let me offer you a hearty welcome to Venice, he said to Glenbarth, after he had shaken hands with myself. And looking at him once more, he added, If you will permit me to say so, you have changed a great deal since we last saw each other. And you scarcely at all, Glenbarth replied. Ah, it is strange that I should not have done so, Nicola answered. I thought a little sadly, for I think I may say without any fear of boasting that since we parted at Pippa Lanou, I have passed through sufficient to change a dozen men. But we will not talk of that here. Let us come up to my room, which is the only place in this great house that is in the least degree comfortable. So saying, he led the way up the stairs, and then along a corridor which had once been beautifully frescoed, which was now sadly given over to damp and decay. At last reaching a room in the front of the building, he threw open the door and invited us to enter. And here I might digress for a moment to remark, that of all the men I have ever met, Nicola possessed the faculty of being able to make himself comfortable wherever he might be, in the greatest degree. He would have been at home anywhere. As a matter of fact, this particular apartment was finished in a style that caused me considerable surprise. The room itself was large and lofty, while the walls were beautifully frescoed, the work of one Andrea Bunapelli, of whom I shall have more to say anon. The furniture was simple, but extremely good. A massive oak writing table stood beside one wall, another covered with books and papers was opposite it. Several easy chairs were placed here and there, another table in the centre of the room, supported various chemical paraphernalia or books of all sorts and descriptions in all languages and bindings were to be discovered in every direction after what you have seen of the rest of the house this strikes you as being more homelike does it not nicola inquired as he noticed the look of astonishment upon our faces it's a queer old place and the more i see of it the stranger it becomes some time ago and quite by chance i became acquainted with its history I do not mean the political history of the respective families that have occupied it. You can find that in any guidebook. I mean the real inner history of the house itself, embracing not a few of the deeds which have taken place inside its walls. I wonder if you'd be interested if I were to tell you that in this very room, in the year 1511, one of the most repellent and cold-blooded murders of the Middle Ages took place. Perhaps now that you have the scene before you, you would like to hear the story. You would, in that case, pray sit down. Let me offer you this chair, Duke, he continued. And as he spoke, he wheeled forward a handsomely carved chair from beside his writing table. Here, Hatteras, is one for you. I myself will take up my position here, 
so that i may be better able to retain your attention for my narrative so saying he stood between us on the strip of polished floor which showed between the two heavy oriental rugs for some reasons he began i regret that the story i have to tell should run upon such familiar lines i fancy however that the denouement will prove sufficiently original to merit your attention the year fifteen hundred and nine the same which found the french victorious at agnadello and the venetian republic of the commencement of that decline from which it has never recovered saw this house in its glory the owner the illustrious francesco di rovici was a sailor and had the honour of commanding one of the many fleets of the republic he was an ambitious man good fighter and as such twice defeated the fleet of the league of camberi it was after the last of these victories that he married the beautiful daughter of the duke of levano one of the most bitter enemies of the council of ten the husband being rich famous and still young enough to be admired for his personal attractions the bride one of the wealthiest as well as one of the most beautiful women in the republic it appeared as if all must be well with them for the remainder of their lives a series of dazzling fates to which all the noblest and most distinguished of the city were invited celebrated their nuptials and their possession of this house yet with it all the woman was perhaps the most unhappy individual in the universe unknown to her husband and her father she had long since given her love elsewhere she was passionately attached to young andrea bunapelli the man by whom the frescoes of this room were painted finding that fate demanded her renunciation of bunapelli and her marriage to rovici she resolved to see no more of the man to whom she had given her heart love however proved stronger than her sense of duty and while her husband by the order of the senate had put to sea once more in order to drive back the french who were threatening the adriatic bunapelli put into operation the scheme that was ultimately to prove their mutual undoing unfortunately for rovici he was not successful in his venture and by and by news reached venice that his fleet had been destroyed and that he himself had been taken prisoner now said the astute bunapelli is the time to act he accordingly took pens paper and his inkhorn and in this very room concocted a letter which purported to bear the signature of the commander of the french forces into whose hands the venetian admiral had fallen and then was its meaning was plain enough it proved that for a large sum of money rovici had agreed to surrender the venetian fleet and in order to secure his own safety in the case the republic should lay hands on him afterwards it was supposed that he himself had only been taken prisoner after a desperate resistance as had really been the case the letter was written and that night the painter himself dropped it into the lion's mouth rovici might return now as soon as he pleased his fate was prepared for him meanwhile the guilty pair spent the time as happily as it was possible under the circumstances knowing full well that should the man against whom they had plotted return to venice it would only be to find himself arrested and with the certainty on the evidence of the incriminating letter of being immediately condemned to death weeks and months went by at last rovici worn almost to a skeleton by reason of his long imprisonment did manage to escape in the guise of a common fisherman he returned to venice reached his own house where a faithful servant recognised him and admitted him to the palace from the latter's lips he learnt all that had transpired during his absence and was informed of the villainous plot that had been prepared against him his wrath knew no bounds but with it all he was prudent he was aware that if his presence in the city were discovered nothing could save him from arrest he accordingly hid himself in his own house and watch the course of events what he saw was sufficient to confirm his worst suspicion his wife was unfaithful to him and her paramour was the man to whom he had been so kind a friend and so generous a benefactor then when the time was ripe assisted by only his servant the same who admitted him to his house he descended upon the unhappy couple under threats of instant death he extorted from them a written confession of their treachery after having made them secure 
he departed for the council chamber and demanded to be heard he was the victim of a conspiracy he declared and to prove that what he said was true he produced the confession he had that day obtained he had many powerful friends and by their influence an immediate pardon was granted him while permission was also given to him to deal with his enemies as he might consider most desirable he accordingly returned to this house with a scheme that he was prepared to put into instant execution it is not a pretty story but it certainly lends an interest to this room the painter he imprisoned here he pressed a spring in the wall so saying nikola stopped and drew back one of the rugs to which i have already referred the square outline of a trap-door showed itself in the floor he pressed a spring in the wall behind him and the lid shot back swung round and disappeared showing the black abyss below a smell of damp vaults came up to us and then when he had closed the trap-door again nikola drew the carpet back to its old position the wretched man died slowly of starvation in that hole and the woman having in this room above was compared to listen to his agony without being permitted the means of saving him can you imagine the scene the dying wretch below doing his best to die like a man in order not to distress the woman he loved and the outraged husband calmly pursuing his studies regardless of both he looked from one to the other of us and his eyes burnt like living coals it was brutish it was hellish cried glambartha upon whom either the story or nicholas manner of narrating it had produced an extraordinary effect why did the woman allow it to continue was she mad that she did not summon assistance surely the authorities of a state which prided itself upon its enlightenment even in those dark ages not have tolerated such a thing he must bear in mind the fact that the republic had given the husband permission to avenge his wrongs said nikola very quietly besides the woman could not cry out for the reason that her tongue had been torn out at the roots when both were dead their bodies were tied together and thrown into the canal and the same day revici set sail again to ultimately perish in a storm off the coast of sicily now you know one of the many stories connected with this old room there are others in which that trap-door has played an equally important part i fear however that none of them can boast so dramatic a setting as that i have just narrated to you how knowing all this you can live in the house passes my comprehension gasped glenbarth i don't think i am a coward but i tell you candidly that i would not spend a night here after what you have told me anything the world could give me but surely you don't suppose that what happened in this room upwards of three hundred years ago could have any effect upon a living being to-day said nikola with what i could not help thinking was a double meaning let me tell you that far from being unpleasant it has decided advantages as a matter of fact it gives me the opportunity of being free to do what i like that is my greatest safeguard i can go away for five years if i please and leave the most valuable of my things lying about and come back to the discovery that nothing is missing i am not pestered by tourists who ask to see the frescoes for the simple reason that the guides take very good care not to tell them the legend of the house lest they may be called upon to take them over it many of the gondoliers will not stop here after nightfall and the few who are brave enough to do so invariably cross themselves before reaching and after leaving it i don't wonder at it i said taken altogether it's the most dismal dwelling i've ever set foot in do you mean to tell me you live alone in it not entirely he replied i have companions an old man who comes in once a day to attend to my simple wants and my ever faithful friend apollyon i cried forestalling what he was about to say exactly apollyon i'm glad to see that you remember him he uttered a low whistle and a moment later the great beast that i remembered so well stalked solemnly into the room and began to rub himself against the leg of his master's chair poor old fellow continued nikola picking him up and gently stroking him he's growing very feeble perhaps it is not to be wondered at for he is already far past the average age of the feline race he has been in many strange places and seen many queer things since we last met but never anything much stranger than he had witnessed in this room what do you mean i inquired what has the cat seen in this room that's so strange objects that we are not yet permitted to see nikola answered gravely 
when all is quiet at night when i am working at that table he lies curled up in yonder chair for a time he will sleep contentedly and i see him lift his head and watch something or somebody i cannot say which moving about the room at first i came to the conclusion it must be a bat or some night bird but that theory exploded bats do not remain in the same exact distance from the floor nor do they stand stationary behind a man's chair for any length of time the hour will come however when it will be possible for us to see these things i am on the track even now had i not known nikola and if i had not remembered some very curious experiments he had performed for my special benefit two years before i should have inclined to the belief that he was boasting i knew him too well however to deem it possible that he would waste his time in such an idle fashion do you mean to say i asked that you really think that in time it would be possible for us to see things which at present we have no notion of that we should be able to look into the world we have always been taught to consider unknowable i do mean it he replied and though you may scarcely believe it it was for the sake of information necessary to that end that i pestered mr wetherell in sydney imprisoned you in port side and carried the lady who is now your wife away to the island of the south seas this is most interesting i said while glenbarth drew his chair a little closer pray tell us some of your adventures since we last saw you he put in you may imagine how eager we are to hear them thereupon nikola furnished us with a detailed description of all that he had been through since that momentous day when he had obtained possession of the stick that had been bequeathed to mr wetherell by china pete he told us how armed with his talisman he had set out for china where he engaged a man named bruce who must have been as plucky as nikola himself and together they started off in search of an almost unknown monastery in Thibet. He described with a wealth of exciting detail the perilous adventures they had passed through, and how near they had been to losing their lives in the attempting to obtain possession of a certain curious book in which were set forth the most wonderful secrets relating to the laws of life and death. He told us of their hairbreadth escapes on the journey back to civilization, and showed how they were followed to England by a mysterious Chinaman, whose undoubted mission was to avenge the robbery and to obtain possession of the book at this moment he paused and i found an opportunity of asking him whether he had the book in his possession now would you care to see it he inquired if so i will show it to you our answering in the affirmative he crossed to his writing table unlocked a drawer and took from it a small curiously bound book the pages of which were yellow with age and the writing so faded that it was almost impossible to decipher it and now that you have plotted and planned and suffered so much to obtain possession of this book what use has it been to you i inquired with almost a feeling of awe for it seemed impossible that a man could have endured so much for so trifling a return in dabbling with such matters nikola returned one of the first lessons one learns is not to expect immediate result there is the collected wisdom of untold ages in that little volume and when i have mastered the secret it contains i shall like the eaters of the forbidden fruit possess a knowledge of all things good and evil replacing the book in the drawer he continued his narrative told us of his great attempt to probe the secret of existence explained to us his endeavour to put new life into a body already worn out by age i was unsuccessful when i set out to accomplish he said but i advanced so far that i was able to restore the man his youth again what i failed to do was to give him the power of thought or will it was the brain that was too much for me that vital part of man without which he is nothing i have mastered that secret i shall try again and then perhaps i shall succeed but there is much to be accomplished first only i know how much i looked at him in amazement was he jesting or did he really suppose that it was possible for him or for any other son of man to restore youth and by doing so to prolong life perpetually yet he spoke with all his usual earnestness and seemed as convinced of the truth of what he said as if he were narrating some well-known fact i did not know what to think at last seeing the bewilderment on our faces i suppose he smiled 
and rising from his chair reminded us that if we had been bored we had only ourselves to thank for it he accordingly changed the conversation by inquiring whether we had made any arrangements for that evening i replied that so far as i knew we had not whereupon he came forward with a proposition in that case he said if you will allow me to act as your guide to venice i think i could show you a side of the city you've never seen before i know her as thoroughly as any man living and i think i may safely promise you that your party will spend an interesting couple of hours what have you to say to my proposal I'm quite sure we shall be delighted i replied though not without certain misgivings but i think i had better not decide until i've seen my wife if she's made no other arrangements but what hour shall we start at what time do you dine he inquired at seven o'clock i replied perhaps we might be able to persuade you to give us the pleasure of your company i thank you he answered but i fear i must decline however i am hermit-like in my habits so far as meals are concerned if you'll allow me i will call for you shall we say half past eight the moon will have risen by that time and we should spend a most enjoyable evening half past eight i said unless you hear to the contrary and then rose from my chair glenbarth followed my example and we accordingly bade nikola good-bye despite our protest he insisted on accompanying us down the great staircase to the courtyard below his terrible cap following close upon his heels hailing a gondola we bade the man take us back to our hotel for some minutes after we had said good-bye to nikola we sat in silence as the boat skimmed over the placid water well what is your opinion of nikola now i said as we turned from the rio del consiglio into the grand canal once more has he grown any more commonplace do you think since you last saw him on the contrary he is stranger than ever glenbarth replied i have never met any other man who resembled him in the slightest degree what a ghastly story that was his dramatic telling of it made it appear so real that towards the end of it i was almost convinced i could hear the groans of the poor wretch in the pit below and see the woman wringing her hands and moaning in the room which we were sitting why he should have told it to us is what i cannot understand neither can i make out what his reasons can be for living in that house nikola's actions are like himself entirely inexplicable he answered but that he has some motive beyond the desire he expressed for peace and quiet i have not the shadow of a doubt and now with regard to to-night said the duke i am afraid a little pettishly i was surprised when you accepted his offer do you think lady hatteras and miss trevor will care about such an excursion that is a question i cannot answer at present i replied you must leave it to them to decide for my own part i can scarcely imagine anything more interesting when we reached galaghetti's i informed my wife and miss trevor of nikola's offer half expecting that the latter from the manner in which she had behaved at the mere mention of his name that morning would decline to accompany us and therefore the excursion would fall through to my surprise however she did nothing of the kind she fell in with the idea at once and so far as we could see without reluctance of any kind there was nothing for it therefore under these circumstances but for me to fall back upon the old commonplace and declare that women are difficult creatures to understand end of chapter two Chapter Three of Farewell, Nicola, by Guy Boothby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three. In the previous chapter, I recorded the surprise I felt at Miss Trevor's acceptance of Doctor Nicola's invitation to a gondola excursion. Almost as suddenly as she had shown her fear of him, she had recovered her tranquillity, and the result, as I have stated, was complete perplexity on my part. With a united desire to reserve our energies for the evening, we did not arrange a long excursion for that afternoon, but contented ourselves with a visit to the church of S. S. Giovanni e Paolo. Miss Trevor was quite recovered by this time, and in very good spirits. She and Glenbarth were on the most friendly terms. Consequently, my wife was a most happy woman. Isn't it nice to see them together, she whispered as we crossed the hall and went down the steps to our gondola. They are suited to each other almost as well if i really wanted to pay you a compliment which you don't deserve 
i should say as we are do you notice how prettily she gives him her hand so that he may help her into the boat i do i answered grimly and it only shows the wickedness of the girl she is as capable of getting into the boat without assistance as he is and yet you help her yourself every time you get the chance my wife retorted i have observed you take greatest care that she should not fall even when the step has only been one of a few inches and i have been left to get down by myself perhaps you cannot recall that day at capri i have the happiest recollections of it i replied i helped her quite half a dozen times and yet you grudge that poor boy the opportunities that you yourself were once so eager to enjoy you cannot deny it i am not going to attempt to deny it i returned i do grudge him his chances and why shouldn't i has she not the second prettiest hands and the second neatest ankle in all europe my wife looked up at me with a suspicion of a smile hovering around her mouth when she does that her dimples are charming and the neatest she inquired as if she had not guessed women can do that sort of thing with excellent effect lady hatteras may i help you into the gondola i said politely and for some reason best known to herself the reply appeared to satisfy her of one thing there could be no sort of doubt miss trevor had taken a decided liking to glenbarth and the young fellow's delight in her company was more than equal to it by my wife's orders i left them together as much as possible during the afternoon that is to say as far as was consistent with the duties of an observant chaperon for instance while we were in the right aisle of the church examining the mausoleum of the doge pietro Moncenigo and the statues of lombardi they were in the choir proper before the famous tomb of andrea vendramin considered by many to be the finest of its kind in venice as we entered the choir they departed into the left transept i fancy however glenbarth must have been a little chagrined when she playing her hand according to the recognised rules suggested they should turn back in search of us back they came accordingly to be received by my wife with a speech that still further revealed to me the duplicity of women you two are naughty children she said with a fairly simulated wrath where on earth have you been we've been looking for you everywhere you're so slow put in miss trevor and then she added without a quaver in her voice or a blush upon her cheek we dawdled about in order to let you catch us up i thought it was time for me to interfere perhaps i should remind you young people that at the present moment you are in a church i said would it not be as well do you think for you to preserve those pretty little prevarications until you're in the gondola you'll be able to quarrel in greater comfort there it will also give phyllis time to collect her thoughts and prepare a new indictment my wife treated me to a look that would have annihilated another man after that i washed my hands of them and turned to the copy of titian's martyrdom of saint peter which victor emmanuel had presented to the church in place of the original which had been destroyed later on we made our way by a long series of tortuous thoroughfares to the piazza of saint mark where we intended to sit in front of florian's calf and watch the people until it was time for us to return and dress for dinner as i have already said miss trevor had all the afternoon been in the best of spirits nothing could have been happier than her demeanour when we left the church yet when we reached the piazza everything was changed apparently she was not really unhappy nor did she look about her in the frightened way that had struck me so unpleasantly on the previous evening it was only her manner that was strange first she was silent then as if she were afraid we might notice it she set herself to talk as if she were doing for mere talking's sake then without any apparent reason she became as silent as a mouse once more remembering what had happened that morning before breakfast i did not question her nor did i attempt to rally her upon the subject to have done either would have been to have risked a reoccurrence of the catastrophe we had so narrowly escaped earlier in the day i accordingly left her alone and my wife in the hope of distracting her attention entered upon an amusing argument with glenbarth upon the evils attendant upon excessive smoking which was the young man's one and so far as i knew only failing unable to combat her assertions he appealed to me for protection take my part there's a good fellow he said pathetically i'm not strong enough to stand against lady hatteras alone no i returned you must fight your own battles when i see a chance of having a little peace i like to grasp it i'm going to take miss trevor to mayor's shop 
on the other side of the piazza in search of new photographs we will leave you to quarrel in comfort here so saying miss trevor and i left them and made our way to the famous shop where i purchased for her a number of photographs of which she had expressed her admiration a few days before after that we rejoined my wife and glenbarth and returned to our hotel for dinner nicola as you may remember had arranged to call for us with his gondola at half past eight and ten minutes before that time i suggested that the ladies should prepare themselves for the excursion i bade them wrap up well for i knew by experience that it is seldom warm upon the water at night when they had left us the duke and i strolled on to the balcony i hope to goodness nicola won't frighten miss trevor this evening said my companion after he had been there a few moments i noticed that he spoke with an anxiety that was by no means usual with him she is awfully sensitive you know and when he likes he can curdle the very marrow in your bones i should have liked her to have had heard the story he told us this morning i suppose there is no fear of his repeating it to-night i should not think so i returned nicola has more tact in his little finger than you and i have in our whole bodies he would be scarcely likely to make such a mistake no i rather fancy that to-night we shall see a new side of his character for my own part i am prepared to confess that i am looking forward to the excursion with a good deal of pleasure i am glad to hear it glenbarth replied as i thought with a savour of sarcasm in his voice i only hope you won't have reason to regret it this little speech set me thinking was it possible that glenbarth was jealous of nicola surely he could not be foolish enough for that that miss trevor had made an impression upon him was apparent but it was full early for him to grow jealous and particularly of such a man while i was thinking of this the ladies entered the room at the same moment we heard nicola's gondola draw up at the steps i thought miss trevor looked a little pale but though still very quiet she was more cheerful than she had been before dinner our guide has arrived i remarked as i closed the windows behind us we'd better go down to the hall miss trevor if you will accompany me the duke will bring phyllis we must not keep nicola waiting we accordingly left our apartments and proceeded downstairs i trust you are looking forward to your excursion miss trevor i said as we descended the stairs if i'm not mistaken you will see venice to-night under circumstances such as you could never have dreamed of before i do not doubt it she answered simply it will be a night to remember little did she guess how true her prophecy was destined to be it was indeed a night that every member of the party would remember all his or her life long when we had reached the hall nicola had just entered it and was in the act of sending up a servant to announce his arrival he shook hands with my wife and then with miss trevor afterwards with glenbarth and then myself his hand was as usual as cold as ice and his face was deathly pale his tall lithe figure was concealed by his voluminous coat but what was lost in one direction was compensated for by the mystery that it imparted to his personality for some reason i thought of mistopheles as i looked at him and in many ways the illustration does not seem an altogether inapt one permit me to express the gratification i feel that you consented to allow me to be your guide this evening lady hatteras he said as he conducted my wife towards the boat while it is an impertinence on my part to imagine i can add to your enjoyment of venice i fancy it is nevertheless in my power to show you a side of the city with which you are not as yet acquainted the night being so beautiful and believing that you would wish to see all you can i have brought a gondola without a cabin i trust i did not do wrong i am sure it would be delightful my wife answered it would have been unendurable on such a beautiful evening to be cooped up in a close cabin besides we should have seen nothing by this time we were on the steps at the foot of which the gondola in question a large one of its class was lying as soon as we had boarded her the gondolier bent to his oar the boat shot out into the stream and the excursion which as i have said we were each of us to remember all our lives had commenced if i shut my eyes now i can recall the whole scene the still moonlit waters of the canal the houses on one side of which were brilliantly illuminated by the moon the other being entirely in the shadow when we were in midstream a boat decorated with lanterns passed us it contained a merry party 
whose progress was enlivened by the strains of the invariable funiculi funicular the words of the tune ring in my memory even now years before we had grown heartily sick of the song now however it possessed a charm that was quite its own how pretty it is remarked my wife and miss trevor almost simultaneously and the former added i could never have believed that it possessed such a wealth of tenderness might it not be that the association that is responsible put in nikola gravely you've probably heard that song at some time when you've been so happy that all the world has seemed the same hearing it to-night has unconsciously recalled that association and funiculi funicula once so despised immediately becomes a melody that touches your heartstrings and so wins for itself a place in your regard that it can never altogether lose we had crossed the canal by this time the gondola with the singers proceeding towards the rialto bridge the echo of the music still lingered in our ears and seemed the sweeter by the reasons of the distance that separated us from it turning to the gondolier who in the moonlight presented a picturesque figure in the stern of the boat nicola said something in italian the boat's head was immediately turned in the direction of a side street and a moment later we entered it it is not my intention nor would it be possible for me to attempt to furnish you with a definite description of the route we followed in the daytime i flatter myself that i have knowledge of the venice of the tourist if you were to give me a pencil and paper i believe i should be able to draw a rough outline of the city and to place st mark's cathedral galagatti's hotel the rialto bridge the arsenal and certainly the railway station in something like their proper positions but at night when i have left the grand canal the city becomes a sealed book to me on this particular evening every street when once we had left the fashionable quarter behind us seemed alike there was the same darkness the same silence and the same reflection of the lights in the water occasionally we happened upon places where business was still being transacted and where the noise of voices smote the air with a vehemence that was like sacrilege a few moments would then elapse and we were plunged into a silence that was almost unearthly all this time nikola kept us continually interested here was a house with a history as old as venice itself there the home of a famous painter yonder the birthplace of a poet or a soldier who had fought his way to fame by pen or sword on one side of the street was the first dwelling of one who had been a plebeian and had died a doge while on the other side was that of a man who had given his life to save his friend nor were nicola's illustrations confined to the past alone men whose names were household words to us and had preceded us and had seen venice as we were seeing it now of each he could tell us something we had never heard before it was the perfect mastery of his subject like that of a man who plays upon an instrument of which he has made a lifelong study that astonished us he could rouse in our hearts such emotions as he pleased could induce us to pity at one moment and to loathing at the next could make us see the city with his eyes and in a measure to love it with his own love that nicola did entertain a deep affection for it was as certain of his knowledge of its history i think i may say now he said when we had been absent from the hotel for upwards of an hour that i have furnished you with a superficial idea of the city let me attempt after this to show you something of its inner life that it will repay you i think you will admit when you have seen it once more he gave the gondolier an order without a word the man entered a narrow street on the right and then turned to the left after which to the right again what are we going to see next that it would be something interesting i had not the least doubt presently the gondolier made an indescribable movement with his oar the first signal that he was about to stop with two strokes he brought the boat alongside the steps and nicola who was the first to spring out assisted the ladies to alight we were now in a portion of venice with which i was entirely unacquainted the houses were old and lofty though sadly fallen into decay where shops existed business was still being carried on but the majority of the owners of the houses in the neighbourhood appeared to be early birds for no lights were visible in their dwellings once or twice men approached us and stared instantly at the ladies of our party 
one of these more impertinent than his companions placed his hand upon miss trevor's arm in a second without any apparent effort nicola laid him upon his back do not be afraid miss trevor he said the fellow has only forgotten himself for a moment so saying he approached the man who scrambled to his feet and addressed him in a low voice no no your excellency the rascal whined for the pity of the blessed saints had i known it was you i would not have dared nicola said something in a whisper to him what it was i have not the least idea but its effect was certainly excellent for the man slunk away without another word after this little incident we continued our walk without further opposition we took several turnings and at last found ourselves standing before a low doorway that it was closely barred on the inside was evident from the sounds that followed when in response to nicola's knocks someone commenced to open it presently an old man looked out first he seemed surprised to see us but when his eyes fell upon nicola all was changed with a low bow he invited him in russian to enter crossing the threshold we found ourselves in a church of the smallest possible description by the dim light a priest could be seen officiating at the high altar and there were possibly a dozen worshippers present there was an air of secrecy about it all the light the voices and the precautions taken to prevent a stranger entering that appealed to my curiosity as they turned to leave the building the little man who admitted us crept up to nicola's side and said something in a low voice to him nicola replied and at the same time patted the man affectionately upon the shoulder then with the same obsequious respect the latter opened the door once more and permitted us to pass out quickly barring it behind us and permitted us to pass out you have seen many churches during your stay in venice lady hatteras nicola remarked as we made our way back towards the gondola i doubt very much however whether you have entered a stranger place of worship than that i know that i have not my wife replied pray who were the people we saw there and why was there so much secrecy observed because nearly all the poor souls you saw there are either suspect or wanted by the russian government they are fugitives from injustice if i may so express it and it is for that reason they are compelled to worship as well as live in hiding but who are they nihilists nikola answered a poor hot-headed lot of people who see their country drifting in a wrong direction have taken it in their heads to try and remedy matters by drastic measures finding their efforts hopeless their properties confiscated and they themselves in danger of death or exile which is worse they have fled from russia some of them the richest manage to get to england some come to venice but knowing that the italian police will turn them out to san ceremoni if they discover them they are compelled to remain in hiding until they are in a position to proceed elsewhere and you help them asked miss trevor in a strange voice as if his answer were a foregone conclusion what makes you think that nikola inquired because the doorkeeper knew you and you spoke so kindly to him the poor fellow has a son nikola replied a hot-headed young rascal who's got into trouble in moscow if he is caught he will without doubt go to siberia for the rest of his life but he will not be caught once more miss trevor spoke as if with authority and in the same hushed voice you have saved him he has been saved the nikola replied he left for america this morning the old fellow was merely expressing to me the gratification he felt at having got him out of such a difficulty now here is our gondola let us get into it we still have much to see and time is not standing still with us one thing impressed me throughout wherever we went nikola was known and not only known but feared and respected his face was a key that opened every lock and in his company the ladies were as safe in the roughest parts of venice as if they had been surrounded by a troop of soldiery when we had seen all that he was able to show us it was nearly midnight and time for us to be getting back to our hotel i trust i have not tired you he said as the ladies took their places in the gondola for the last time not in the least both answered at once and i fancy my wife spoke not only for herself but also for miss trevor when she continued we have spent a most delightful evening you must not praise the performance until the epilogue is spoken nikola answered i still have one more item on my programme as he said this the gondola drew up at some steps where a solitary figure was standing apparently waiting for us 
he wore a cloak carried a somewhat bulky object in his hand as soon as the boat came alongside nicholas sprang out and approached him to our surprise he helped him into the gondola and placed him in the stern tonight luigi he said you must sing your best for the honour of the city the young man replied in an undertone and then the gondola passed down a by street and a moment later we were back in the grand canal there was not a breath of air and the moon shone full and clear upon the placid water never had venice appeared more beautiful away to the right was the piazza with the cathedral of st mark on our left were the shadows of the islands the silence of venice there is no silence in the world like it lay upon everything the only sound to be heard was the dripping of the water from the gondolier's oar as it rose and fell in rhythmic motion then the musician drew his fingers across the strings of his guitar and after a little prelude commenced to sing the song he had chosen was the salve de amora from faust surely one of the most delightful melodies that has ever occurred to the brain of a musician before he had sung a dozen bars we were entranced though not a strong tenor his voice was one of the most perfect i have ever heard it was of the purest quality so rich and sweet that the greatest connoisseur could not tire of it the beauty of the evening the silence of the lagoon and the perfectness of the surroundings helped it to appeal to us as no music had ever done before it was a significant proof of the effect produced upon us when he ceased not one of us spoke for some moments our hearts were too full for words by the time we had recovered ourselves the gondola had drawn up at the steps of the hotel and we had disembarked the duke and i desired to reward the musician nicola however begged us to do nothing of the kind he sings to-night to please me he said it would hurt him beyond words were you to offer him any other reward after that there was nothing more to be said except to thank him in the best italian we could muster for the treat he had given us why on earth does he not try his fortune upon the stage asked my wife when we had disembarked from the gondola and had assembled on the steps with such a voice he might achieve a european reputation alas answered nicola he will never do that did you notice his infirmity phyllis replied that she had not observed anything extraordinary about him the poor fellow is blind nicola answered very quietly he is a singing bird shut up always in the dark and now good night i have trespassed too long upon your time already he bowed to the lady shook hands with the duke and myself and before we had time to thank him for the delightful evening he had given us was in his gondola once more and out in midstream we watched him until he had disappeared in the direction of the rio del consiglio after we entered the hotel and made our way to our own sitting-room i cannot say when i have enjoyed myself so much said my wife as we stood talking together before bidding each other good night been delightful said glenbarth whose little attack of jealousy seemed to have quite left him have you enjoyed it hatteras i said something in reply i cannot remember what but i recollect that as i did so i glanced at miss trevor's face it was still very pale but her eyes shone with extraordinary brilliance i hope you've had a pleasant evening i said to her a few moments later when we were alone together yes i think i can say that i have she answered with a faraway look upon her face the music was exquisite the thought of it haunts me still and having bade me good night she went off with my wife leaving me to attempt to understand why she had replied as she had done and what do you think of it my friend i inquired of glenbarth when we had taken our cigars out into the balcony i'm extremely glad we went he returned quickly there can be no doubt that you were right when you said it would show us nicholas character in a new light did you notice with what respect he was treated by everybody we met and how anxious they were not to run the risk of offending him of course i noticed it and you may be sure i drew my own conclusions from it i replied and those conclusions were that nicholas's character is even more inexplicable than before after that we smoked in silence for some time at last i rose and tossed what remained of my cigar over the rails into the dark waters below it's getting late i said don't you think we'd better bid each other good night perhaps we had and yet i don't feel a bit tired are you quite sure that you've had a pleasant day quite sure he said with a laugh the only thing i regret is having heard that wretched story this morning do you recall the gusto with which nicola related it i replied in the affirmative and asked him his reason for referring to it now 
because I could not help thinking of it this evening when his voice was so pleasant and his manner so kind. And I picture him going back to that house tonight, to that dreadful room, to sleep alone in that great building. It fairly makes me shudder. Oh, good night, old fellow. You have treated me royally today. I could scarcely have had more sensations compressed into my waking hours if I'd been a king. End of chapter 3